Unlocked, the official podcast of the Jacksonville Public Library. I'm Gabby, and on this episode, we interview Craig Pittman. He's a journalist and New York Times bestselling author of Oh, Florida, How America's Weirdest State Influences the Rest of the Country. It's a book that provides a historical and hilarious analysis of Florida and shows how Florida can be both a paradise and a punchline. Craig Pittman came up to the main library from St. Petersburg to do an author talk. So we were so excited he was able to squeeze us in his schedule for the podcast. Unfortunately, his only availability was on Saturday before his author talk, which also happened to be Amanda's birthday. So our graphic designer, Kristen, filled her spot on the show for the interview. Kristen and I picked Craig's brain about hurricane parties, Florida Man, Mermaids of Wikiwachi, the skunk ape, and so much more. We really did not stop laughing the entire time. So without further ado, here is our interview with Craig Pittman. Thank you so much, Craig Pittman, for joining us today. Welcome to the show. Thank you. My pleasure. So before we dive into O Florida, can you tell us a little bit about your background and your career at the Tampa Bay Times? Sure. Um, I'm a native Floridian. Uh, I grew up in Pensacola um, and uh, sort of absorbed some of the state's weirdness there growing up uh, and then uh, went to study journalism at a university in Alabama called uh, Troy State. Uh, where uh, an agitated dean once labeled me the most destructive force on campus. Uh, and I don't think he meant it as a compliment, believe it or not. Um, uh, and then when I graduated, uh, I came back to my hometown and spent five years working for the Pensacola News Journal, and then uh, three years at the Sarasota Paper, and then I've been at the uh, Tampa Bay Times, formerly the St. Petersburg Times, since 1989. Uh, and I've been covering environmental issues uh, since 1998, which to me is the greatest beat in American journalism, because there are just so many great environmental issues going on in Florida. Plus, I get to cover some of the really weird, wacky stuff that happens here, like pythons battling alligators for supremacy <laughs> in the Everglades. Um, so what are some of the strangest stories you recount in O Florida? Um, well, I mean, it's it's hard to put them on a on a grading system because uh, they're just they're just flat out weird. A lot of them. Um, um, probably my favorite one is one from Fort Lauderdale, uh, where a woman named Kathy Willits was, um, shall we say, entertaining customers at home for pay. And when the cops uh, busted her, they busted her husband, who was the clients didn't realize was hiding in the closet with uh, a video camera and a big yellow legal pad taking notes. And it turned out he was a cop. Um, And so then a group of her clients got together um, under the name John Doe and filed suit to try and keep her client list secret. Uh, And that case went all the way to the Florida Supreme Court. And meanwhile, some very enterprising people got together and printed up T-shirts that said, I'm not on the list. And they sold out. (laughs) (laughs) And the the story took a lot more twists and turns after that. But uh, I just, which is to me, the hallmark of a great Florida story is just when you think it's as weird as it can get, it gets a little weirder. Um, Just to give you a taste, uh, the Willits's claim that this was actually marriage therapy for them. Uh, and uh, apparently it worked because they're still married today, 20 years later. <laughs> wow. Um, and as a journalist, is it hard to remain serious when you're reporting about events like this? Or is it just kind of being a Floridian journalist, that's kind of what it entails? It's helpful to have a good poker face, let's put it that way. Um, but, I mean, some of the things, the people involved realize this is crazy and they'll tell you that. And then, you know, kind of all you can do is laugh. Um, I was doing a story about uh, giant African land snails that have invaded uh, South Florida, invaded Miami-Dade, and they're moving into Broward now. And they, their origin story is that they were smuggled in by a religious cult that thought that drinking the snail's mucus would make you healthy. I actually had the opposite effect. Imagine that. <laughs> and when they all showed up at the hospital, that's how the authorities found out, hey, these very destructive snails are here now and we have to do something about it. But I just I picture the guy sitting in the seat next to the lady that had smuggled him in under her dress. Uh, on a plane and saying, man, did you know your dress is slowly <laughs> undulating back and forth? <laughs> and I was on the phone with a, um, a Santeria priest who was sort of educating me on the law about, uh, about why legally the uh, authorities hadn't gone after this particular cult. And, uh, and when he got to the part about her smuggling under her dress, I couldn't help it. I started laughing. He said, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and he laughed a little bit too. But it, it, all, it was all tied up with a Supreme Court case that he'd been involved in that said, under the First Amendment, you're allowed to do animal sacrifices <laughs> for religious purposes. 
And that was a that was a case that happened right here in Florida and wound up act, playing a role in some of the immigration decisions recently that the Supreme Court made. That that was a precedent, believe it or not. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> why why do you think Florida is such a nexus for weirdness? Um, I there I go into it in some detail in the book. Uh, there are a number of factors. One is we've undergone this wrenching demographic change here. In in 1940, we were the least populated Southern state. And now we're the third most populated state. Uh, we've got about 21 and a half million people living here now um, from all over the world. And we've got 100 million tourists who come every year. And we're not evenly spread over the whole state. We're kind of crammed into that 30 mile wide swath along the coast and, and along I-4 where the theme parks are. So you put that many people together from that many different backgrounds and cultures, cram them into this, that small a space, and they're bound to start ramming into each other's cars <laughs> Chasing each other with machetes and arguing over whose dog pooped on whose lawn. The heat makes people crazy. Well, the, the, some, the, the weather does play a factor. It means that we're out doing crazy stuff all year long. We're not cooped up indoors for three months like people in Ohio. Uh, and that also means we have more nudist resorts here than anywhere else. Um, uh, and they, they vary. I mean, you can get the, the really high-end expensive ones, although how you can tell they're expensive if nobody's wearing clothes, I don't know. Um, and then at the other end, you have one called the Bear Buns Biker Club, which <laughs> just sounds like a really bad idea. <laughs> it's a it's Florida a icon. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's why I just loved your book so much because I you don't realize how weird Florida is mm -hmm. until you're, you grow up a little bit. Like, I know you mentioned in the book Hooters is not a family restaurant. Like, I didn't know that. Right. I grew exactly. up going to Hooters with yeah. my family. We were from the St. <laughs> Pete Clearwater area. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you this, amazing chicken wings. Amazing peanut butter pie. That was my ah, favorite thing when I was growing up. That was like, I was so excited to go to Hooters. You were like, what, you were like because of the pie. 12, mom, mom, yeah, can we go to Hooters totally. for my birthday? <laughs> yeah. And then I remember at one point it was one of those like kids say the darnest things moments where I'm like, <laughs> I want to be a waitress, like at Hooters, oh, like Lord. when I grow up. <laughs> and they're like, "All right, Dream it's big. time to Dream big, yeah. <laughs> time to uh, find a new time restaurant." I guess that, I don't know, yeah. but that I mean, your book just really like investigates why is Florida like this? Is yeah. it? And I think also it's interesting that you're an environmental reporter, yeah. and you know, I mean, it is one of the most unique environments Absolutely. in the world. Yeah, the ecosystems yeah. we have. The there. Yeah. We have a wide variety of, of natural environments. A lot of really interesting native species, and we have more invasives than anywhere else. So I've written about, you know, I mentioned the giant African land snails, the pythons. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I went python hunting with these two women from St. Petersburg who run a dog grooming salon part of the week. And then the rest of the week, they drive down to the Everglades and hunt pythons. And uh, the, they, the Yorkie population thanks them for that. <laughs> sure it does. <laughs> and they were, they were really interesting. And, and uh, they were telling me, you know, oh, yeah, we have, think nothing of you know, seeing a big 10 foot python and just jumping on it and grabbing it and wrestling it around and tiring it out. And, and, uh, and one of them said, yeah, if we're down at the bottom of a levee, what I like to do is I'll let the body wrap around my legs so that I can just walk it back up the, the levee so I can then take it off and put it at the box. But if a bug flies in the car while they're doing it, they, they abandon ship. They can't, they can't stand bugs. They hate bugs. <laughs> um, and so while we were running around and they were dodging the bugs, they mentioned, oh yeah, and a lot of the a lot of the python hunters they live at the Skunk Ape Research Headquarters. That's where <laughs> they camp out. We camp out at a different camping spot. But I was like, really? And they said, yeah. So I went by the Skunk Ape Research Headquarters. Yeah. Maybe for our listeners, explain okay. what the um, Skunk Ape um, is. Florida is, as far as I can tell, the only state with not one but two Bigfoot relatives. Uh, the one in North Florida is called the Barden Booger. It's not very well known. It's but it's mostly around the small town of Barden and sort of the Green Swamp area. And then the other one is better better known, and that's the the skunk ape, so called because of its really bad smell. Um, and uh, it's so well known that there was actually legislation that was introduced in, the, <laughs> in Tallahassee for the protection of skunk apes, so people wouldn't molest skunk apes. <laughs> Um, and there's a there's a place there that calls itself the Skunk Ape Research Headquarters, where you can stop in and buy Skunk Ape T-shirts and bumper stickers and so forth. And there's a petting zoo with a 24 foot reticulated python that will raise up its head and look at you, <laughs> and you'll be like, "Yikes!" <laughs> um, and then there uh, next door is a little campground, and that's where a lot of the the python hunters working for the South Florida Water Management District or the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. They're unofficial they, they, headquarters. Yeah, exactly. Why not stay at the Skunk Ape Research Headquarters when you're looking for pythons? Why not visit, you know, a pretend monster when you're looking for ones? <laughs> <laughs> I was telling Justin before you arrived that I was going through the book 
And I was looking at, oh, there's so many interesting, fascinating, bizarre facts. I had, I had to cut 100 pages. I believe it. I, I would believe it if you told me 200, Out, 300. Out, I, the skunk ape is not in that book. The skunk ape is in my next book. Uh, out, but out went, so out went the skunk ape, out went, uh, the guy who said he had a love affair with a dolphin. I mean, I had to, I <laughs> had to take some stuff out. Well, can't read, I can't wait to read the next one. <laughs> just going through this one, I'm like, I'm only going to dog, okay, I'm only going to dog ear the stuff that's <laughs> truly, utterly weird. Mm -hmm. And I was about a third of the way through and realized mm -hmm. that I had already doubled the size of the book <laughs> by folding the pages. I had to unfold mm -hmm. them all. <laughs> Everything was just too weird. Yeah, yeah, that's. That's Florida. Let's talk about Florida Man. Okay. Um, I feel like, well, obviously he's always existed as we see from yeah. the collection of facts in your book, but I feel like recently he's kind of gained global recognition, mm -hmm. if, you know, only as a meme. But how would you describe Florida Man? Uh, Florida Man is a, a guy who um, does not have his eye on the ball, maybe is a good way to put it. <laughs> he has goals, but they're, but they're not very good goals, and often he has trouble carrying them out. Um uh, often alcohol or other uh, substances are involved in this. Uh, and um, how, can I, how can I say this? On the one hand, I recognize that there that this exists, that in real life there are real Florida men and Florida women who do crazy, goofy, wacky stuff uh, and often get arrested for it. And, um, um, uh, and But some of the stuff they do, they don't get arrested for it. But, you know, like there's a guy who's famous for going out in the middle of a hurricane and Playing his guitar really loud. I am. I actually live catty corner to Lane Pittman. Okay, that's the guy. He's you a may local know celebrity. as, yeah. may know the, as the hurricane. No relation. <laughs> I hasten to add. No relation. But but yeah, he and he, you know, and he's famous for that. And that's famous. He's, he's, he's done more than one. He did it for <laughs> yeah. Matthew. He did Verma. He drove. He actually drove north. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So so there are people like that, and then uh, you know, and and people who belong to uh, this place down in Southwest Florida called the Redneck Yacht Club, where they go out mud bogging and drinking and getting into scrapes. And that's, you know, that sort of fits the profile. But I always tell people, you know, remember the list of Florida men doesn't just include those people, but it also includes Ray Charles, who went to the St. Augustine School for the Deaf and Blind and learned to play the piano there. It includes Billy Graham, who got the call to preach on an abandoned golf course in Temple Terrace um, and and, try and practiced his preaching by by yelling at the alligators in the Hillsborough River. Um, uh John Adonassoff, the guy who invented the first computer, he was a Florida man. He grew up in Polk County. His dad was a phosphate mining engineer who always carried a slide rule. And young John became fascinated with the slide rule, and that's what led to him ultimately inventing this wonderful machine we use to watch cat videos. You know, <laughs> so so just bear that in mind that that's yes, Florida man exists, but that's not the whole picture. And if you if you only focus on the fact that we're the punchline state, you miss an awful lot of other stuff about Florida that's actually kind of cool. He gets a bad rap, but I will say there have been occasions recently in the media where he's seen as this just force of determination. Like he gets, he gets a good rap. Uh, what was it? The meme that went around where they were going to invade area. Area oh, 51. Area 50. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they listed all the different groups it would take. And among them was one Florida man. <laughs> Single well, Florida man. Well, and his man. machete. And his machete. Well, <laughs> and I mean, machete. That's, yeah. that comes part yeah. and parcel with Florida yes, man. Yes, it does. Here's, I have a friend who claims Area 51 is actually a distraction and that the, the real alien landing was here in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> And you know to what? him, that explains everything. You know what? That checks out. <laughs> it's worth, yeah, that, that one's worth kind of exploring, I think. Oh, yeah. Well, there was a guy, he lived in Brooksville. He's no, He was known as the dean of UFO abductees because he had the earliest report of having been abducted by a UFO. And uh, he went to the extent of building what he said was a replica of the flying saucer that captured him in his front yard. And he put lights on it. And they had a problem with pe people would be driving by and see it and would veer off the road and crash. <laughs> <laughs> and then relate to others their UFO experience. Yes, exactly. <laughs> oh, man. Um, so it kind of seems fitting that there is a major hurricane approaching as we're yes. recording this podcast. Yes. Um, and you have a whole chapter called Flirting with Disaster. Right. In, in which I suggest that our state song should not be Old Folks at Home, but it should be Flirting with Disaster by the Jacksonville-based <laughs> Molly Hatchet. Do you hear that, Jackson? will start the petition. Exactly. Yes. Um, so, and in the chapter, you talk about how there are two types of Floridians. There are the preppers, and then there are the partiers. Mm -hmm. um, and I know both. I know yeah, both. Yeah. And, exa and it just, that's so accurate. You go to Publix, and they have, like, hurricane cookie cakes, and, <laughs> yes. you know, and some people get really upset there was a by place, that. There was a place here, a bakery here, that was selling Dorian Donut. Yes. Sonati. Yes. It's like a cute little mom and pop shop. Mm -hmm. So it, 
What do you make of that? Like, why why do Floridians kind of turn a major natural disaster into a punchline? Well, I mean, I think that's our nature. You know, we we are surrounded by all of these perils. I, I, I always tell people, Florida is hurricane season is our annual reminder that Florida is trying to kill us. Mm-hmm. We're we're the uh, North American version of Australia. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we we get hit by more hurricanes than any other state. We uh, we have more sinkholes than anywhere else in America. Uh, we have more lightning than anywhere in the Western Hemisphere, uh, more people bitten by sharks in Florida than anywhere else in the world, including Australia. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we're more vulnerable to climate change than any other state. And, you know, and so you put all that together, plus, of course, that creepy clown college down in Sarasota. <laughs> <laughs> and yet we call it we call ourselves paradise. So, <laughs> you know. Uh, that's but just I, that's just a good marketing. It is a good marketing, but I think it's I think it's real too that people feel people who live here feel like I am living in paradise, you know, because we have these beautiful sunsets, we have these world-renowned beaches, we have a, an award-winning state park system, and uh, lovely weather most of the time. And you know, at least with the hurricanes, you get a lot of warning, unlike with you know earthquakes and and tornadoes. So um, I think it's just in our nature to feel like, well, you know, a hurricane's coming. Is it a, is it a cat three yet? No, then I'm not going to take it seriously. <laughs> and I, I think I mentioned before we started recording, a friend of mine was telling me she was in line at Publix buying water, you know, buying water like you can't get water out of the tap that you can store. And the lady in line ahead of her had six bottles of wine, and that was her <laughs> hurricane plan right there in a nutshell. <laughs> there is there's water in wine. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Stay hydrated. <laughs> Got to stay hydrated any way you can. We actually went to Publix and stocked up on Gatorade. Ah, there you go. Because there was no more water. I'm sure UF was happy with that. <laughs> You're going to be so full of electrolytes and fear. <laughs> I think full of electrolytes and fear. I think that's our state motto. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get that on a seal. <laughs> How have Floridians across the state responded to you? Because anybody ever been offended by a particular stereotype? I have, had, I, have had, I have had universal praise except for one person who was offended by the chapter of the book about guns and and uh, particularly the Sunshine Law, and that was Marion Hammer. Like, of like the, the gun, of the, the gunshine state. The, yes, brilliant. <laughs> Mar- Marion Hammer of the National Rifle Association, former president of the NRA, and and sort of their uber lobbyist. She wrote the concealed weapons law that Florida has. She has concealed weapons permit number zero 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 one. That's a scary person to have displeased with. She, well, she's a, you know she's a, a grandmother in her late seventies, uh, but she's packing. She's definitely packing <laughs> heat, and she uh, was so offended by the story I told about how the stand your ground law, which she wrote, got passed that she said that she wished that the senator who was one of the co sponsors who was dead now, she wished he was alive to slap my arrogant face. Wow. So I'm just going to steer clear of seances. <laughs> I think that's my my goal here. Isn't that like the best sort of response you can get as a journalist, though? Like you should have a T-shirt that says that. Like, <laughs> well, <you've- laughs> I, I, no, I would rather her say, wow, you really you really got everything accurate and I don't like it. But, you know, but no, she's like, no, no, this is terrible. And But she couldn't point to anything being inaccurate. She was just offended at the at the story because it made her look bad. Uh, but everybody else seems to really like it. And what I particularly like is that when I go around and, and make presentations like the one I'm going to do today, inevitably there's somebody who comes up to me afterward and tells me their Florida story. And it's better than anything in my book. <laughs> uh, the classic one is uh, the couple that told me about how they discovered quite by accident that their new next door neighbors were running an illegal nudist bed and breakfast. <laughs> and the way they found out is that they gave their kids a trampoline for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> mom, mom, mom. <laughs> um, and then, you know, uh, another one was a lady who told me this long but hilarious story. I'm, I'm not sure I can recount it about how her husband wound up getting arrested for molesting a manatee. <laughs> So, wow. so I'm just, you know, <laughs> no, no, I need, I need more information. Gets, I need more information. He gets into the county jail and they're like, so what are you in it for? <laughs> DUI? Did you kill somebody? No, I molested a manatee. You what? <laughs> you <laughs> so monster. Even the, yeah, even the other inmates were, were Yeah. Offended. <laughs> It was innocent. His intentions were innocent. Let's just put it that way. (laughs) I I think the manatee would beg to disagree. (laughs) Are there any other of your personal stories that would have made it in the book had they happened before it was published? Um, Yeah. And I I talk about this in my presentation that after the book was done and it was too late to make any changes, um, one day I was driving my son home from school. And the last chapter of the book uh, is talks about how weirdness is all around you if you know where to look for it. And the example I use is going to pick my kid up from school and driving him home and all the places we pass along the way where weird things have happened. So after after all, you know, after it's too late to put anything in the book, one day we're driving home 
And we happen to spot this woman who is up in a banyan tree in front of the Museum of Fine Arts in St. Petersburg. And her blonde hair is in dreadlocks, and she's wearing this colorful Eastern European costume. And she's got somehow gotten an accordion up there with her. Of course she, of and, course she has an accordion. Yes, and she's playing and singing John Denver songs at the top of her lungs. And so I pointed her out. My son, I said, why do you think that lady with the blonde dreadlocks and the Eastern European dress and the accordion is playing and singing John Denver songs at the top of her lungs up in a tree? And he said, it's Florida, Dad. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, I guess we're raising you the right way. <laughs> That's the right response. <laughs> smart, smart yeah. kid. I, yeah, I don't think I realized until I went to college, really, like looking back at mm-hmm. some of the things, I was like, this isn't normal. Like, this is not. Yeah, yeah. This well, when is you not... grow up in it, when yeah. you're indoctrinated in it, yes. you don't realize it's weird until someone starts, until you start recounting tales from your childhood <laughs> to yeah. outsiders. Yeah. And then they're they're writing it down. They're writing it down for the restraining order. <laughs> 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 How do you, like, if you have a quick two minutes and you're talking to, like, because I've always found if I am talking to somebody who's, you know, from outside of the country or... And I'm like, I'm from Florida. They're like, oh, Miami. It's like, no, no, no. Miami's kind of totally mm-hmm. It's separate. its own thing. It's its, its own, own thing. thing. Florida yeah. is. We have 10 major media markets here. I mean, everybody's sort of separate, and yet we're all in this together. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, the, the weirdness is pretty evenly spread, except <laughs> possibly, I think, a lot more of it's concentrated in Pasco County than anywhere else. But I, I can <laughs> attest to that. Yeah. Um, how do you briefly, if you only have a, a couple of minutes, how do you briefly describe Florida? Um I tell people we are the most interesting state. Uh, We have, you know, as I mentioned before, we have beautiful sunsets, award-winning parks, uh, gorgeous beaches, and truly the most interesting police blotter in the entire United States. (laughs) Um, They've had, they started having fun with it since social media has blossomed. Yes. Well, and I contend in the book that it started with the 2000 election, that we had a, we had a pretty good reputation up till then. And then when we, it took us three weeks to figure out who the next leader of the free world was supposed to be, uh, people were like, this, those people down there, they ain't right. Um, and, it, and, uh, at that, and in 2001, the satirical website, fark.com, gave us our own category, you know, floor for Florida stories. And I think it sort of started there, uh, people realizing Florida's pretty weird. And you know what? They're not wrong. <laughs> Does any other state come close? California used to be the king of weirdness, and I think that was mostly because of the 60s and what happened, what happened 60s and 70s. But I mean, they don't have, you know, sort of institutionalized weirdness like we have. I mean, we have, we have mermaids on the state payroll. I mean, no other state <laughs> has that, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Can you talk about WikiWatchy a little bit? Sure. Okay. I love talking about WikiWatchy. <laughs> um, uh, WikiWatchy is this beautiful natural spring. We have, by the way, Florida has more, uh, first magnitude springs than anywhere else in the world. And first magnitude, referring to how much water gushes out. You, you definitely it. want to go to a spring to see a beautiful, clear blue water, not to the ocean, not to the beach. It's, yeah. It's, it's gorgeous. And, and, uh, William Bartram, a pioneering naturalist wrote so beautifully about our springs in the 1700s. It actually inspired Samuel Taylor Coleridge's poem about Kublai Khan. Um, so the, the springs are gorgeous. So this guy named Newton Perry gets out of the Navy in, after World War II, comes to Florida and buys a spring and builds an underwater theater there and hides air hoses all around. And then he hires these nubile young women to uh, swim around in the spring and wave at the tourists and wear costumes. And at some point they tried on mermaid tails and that really caught people's attention. And so the place became really popular for the wiki watchy mermaids swimming around and, and waving and you know doing underwater stuff. And uh, it became such a big deal. Elvis came to visit, lots of other big names. And then in the mid-2000s, uh, business started to <clears throat> tail off. Um, oh, Craig. Yes, I, Craig, love, Craig. I love a bad pun. <laughs> um, uh, and so rather than see the place be sold to developers, the state, to their credit, stepped in and bought the place uh, in order to maintain its its integrity, quote unquote. And, uh, and they still have mermaid shows there, and it's now a state park that you can visit. And so, you know, as a result, that has led to some interesting discussions about uh, the use of tax dollars to pay for waterproof lipstick and shell bras. <laughs> um, uh, but but yeah, and and the great thing to me is that it's not just confined to that, but that sort of became uh, the the um, the spark, the seed, if you will, uh, of a whole mermaid industry in Florida. Uh, that they you have now have mermaid pods in Pensacola and down in the Keys and. Uh, there's sort of a burlesque mermaid show uh, in, a, in at the Rec Bar in Fort Lauderdale where they swim around through, and you can see them through the portholes. Uh, there was one up this way who I think was also a fire eater 
you know, she would pop up out of the water and <laughs> shoot fire out of her mouth. Combining and, all of the elements into yes, a single show. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. And, and, and you know, and they, they're, they're interesting people. I, I interviewed a whole bunch of them. I did a whole story about Florida's mermaid industry. And, and there's a guy who was a merman at Wikiwachi and quit because of what he said was mermaid politics. <laughs> which, <laughs> And now he makes a makes a really good living making the tails. He's the mer tailor, and <laughs> and he you know you send him your specifications and he'll design a mermaid tail for you, but it'll cost you several thousand dollars. How much do those things weigh? I remember going sixty as a pounds. Child and they're huge. Sixty pounds. Sixty pounds. Wow. Yeah, the the good ones. You know, the like that are that are um, spandex. I think. Um, and uh, so you pull on this sixty pound prosthetic. Sixty tail. pounds dry or wet? <clears throat> this is this is dry, and then you you know you slide into the water and rem- you can't. I'm not a very good swimmer. The one time I went swimming with the manatees, I scared them all away. Um, <laughs> At least you didn't molest them. <laughs> no, I did not molest it. Uh, but uh, but you have to, you know, you have to kick your legs in unison, which would just really throw me off. So, but uh, they have people showing up there all the time that want to do the mermaid. They have mermaid classes at Wikiwachi, so you can see what it's like and, you know, try your luck as a mermaid. And and uh, people keep coming back. One lady I quoted in the book, she worked at Wikiwachi and then said, this is childish. I got to do something legit for a living. And she went away. And then like a year and a half later, she was back. She said, I'm just a mermaid. I have to admit. <laughs> in <laughs> I her can't soul. Be in her else. soul. She the soul of a mermaid. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's people think it might look silly, but the physicality required. Yes. To kick around a 60 pound yeah. tail. And hold your breath. I You're mean, You're doing got, underwater Cirque du Soleil. Yeah. You've got air hoses, but you know, you you can't really let the crowd see you sneak in a, a breath. Because so you're, you're a mermaid. Hold, you're a you mermaid. Get, yeah. So you got to hold your breath while you're doing these routines. And the training process is actually very elaborate, and uh, you can gra- only eat sushi. They go full <laughs> meta. <laughs> to graduate, you have to design your own underwater routine and do it for the other mermaids, and they give you the thumbs up or thumbs down. Are you down. telling me there's a council of mermaids? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I'm sorry. All <laughs> I the love talk of mermaids made me I love made me thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> is it true that one of them died during the show, like in the 90s? I don't know. I've never been able to verify that. Okay, because I remember going as a kid in summer camp. We did a field trip, and one kid ruined it for everyone. Was like one of the mermaids died one time, and we're all like, <laughs> "No, what?" No. And we're just watching this. There's and always we, one kid like yeah, that. Yeah, nobody can blink. We're just waiting for one of them to go down. It was horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and now, her hand was a hook. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it That's was the like next. the child was one desperate those, for attention. Yeah. He was yeah. not getting it home. <laughs> Never could debunk the myth, but that yeah. was yeah, interesting. interesting Interesting place too. It's I mean, kind of it's physically stressful to be down there and to be doing that. Absolutely. And, and uh, the on the on the flip side though. Uh, oh, Craig, Craig, Craig. What? Is that the another flip <laughs> side? Yes, I had to go there. Um, uh, they they had a, an open casting call for New Mermaids a couple of years ago, and they had I think sixty women showed up for the tryouts. And in the middle of these tryouts, which were in January, so the water was really cold. In the middle of the tryouts, a manatee surfaced. So. And you can't get more Florida than that, because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you, know? you know the you know uh, of course manatees were the inspiration for the mermaid mermaids yes uh, uh, description and the very first written record we have of manatees in the New World is when is Christopher Columbus uh, on in his captain's log he apparently saw some manatees and he wrote that mermaids were not nearly as attractive as he had led to believe. <laughs> They're so ugly and gray. Yeah, he'd been at sea for like six months, though. <laughs> Listen, he's not saying he wouldn't date one casually, no, but no, he doesn't no. know if they're marriage material. No. <laughs> so in the subtitle of the book, How America's Weirdest State Influences the Rest of the Country, what right. are some examples of that? Um, there are lots of them. And, and I, I tried to organize the book by, by subject so that each chapter I start off telling some of the wacky stuff that's happened, uh, but then it sort of leads into talking about the things that have uh, uh, influenced the rest of the country. For instance, there's a you know there's a chapter on uh, growing up in Florida. There's a chapter on gambling in Florida. There's a chapter on driving in Florida, which is not the same as the chapter on gambling. Uh, <laughs> I hasten to add. But uh, so with the driving story, I tell lots of you know crash stories, road rage stories. We have the best road rage stories of all. My favorite one is from Gainesville. The headline in the Gainesville Sun was "Man in Road Rage Incident Runs Over Self." Um, <laughs> Uh, but then don't that, get out of the car. Don't get <laughs> yeah, out of the car. yeah, yeah. And and I mentioned that in 2012, so many people ram in Florida ram their cars into post offices that the po- post office ran public service ads saying, "Please stop. We don't need a drive through. We're good." Um, <laughs> but that leads up to telling the story about how NASCAR was founded in Daytona Beach in 1947 uh, by a guy named Bill France Jr. who really liked driving fast and turning left a lot. 
and um, uh, it's become this multi-billion dollar sport today. So, you know, that <clears throat> there are lots of examples of that. Um, uh, the chapter on gambling goes into some detail about uh, Bolita, which was the sort of the numbers racket uh, for uh, uh, originally for Cuban immigrants here, and then and then it was taken over by the mafia, and how that led to uh, Meyer Lansky and Santo Traficante Jr. owning casinos in Cuba and getting involved in the Kennedy assassination and and so forth. But then that leads up to me telling about how uh, the Seminole tribe became the first Native American tribe to open an uh, an Indian casino. And there was a court case. The the uh, Broward sheriff tried to stop them, and they won. And that opened the door for other Native American tribes around the country to open their own casinos. So, you know, once again, Florida influencing the rest of the country, usually in ways that people in the rest of the country don't even have any idea about. You know, if you've used a public defender, that's a Florida influence right there. Uh, if you've ever visited a National Wildlife Refuge, well, the first one was in Florida. So, uh, you know, it's, there are lots and lots of examples of that. Um, and on that note, let's talk about St. Augustine a little bit. I love, I love talking about St. Augustine. Yeah, it's so close to us. It, it really is beautiful for day trips, but you go and it's just like strewn with these, you know, the fountain of youth yes. and Ripley's Believe It or Not. And, you know, you have grown men dressed in pirate costumes, mm -hmm. handing out pamphlets for ghost tours and yes. things like that. It's a and, snake and by, oil mecca. By yeah. the way, that's a great ghost tour if you ever go, <laughs> if you ever go. Because they tell the story about the, the bishop who died and they wanted, he was very socially prominent. And so all the socially prominent people wanted to come to the funeral, but, you know, it, it, they had to, everybody lived kind of a long way away. And it was hard to get everybody there. So they had the bishop in this glass case and they had him on display. A Vita, and, all on a Vita. And, you know, it was during the summer. It was a little warm. And um, in the middle of the funeral, the glass case exploded. And the really prominent people who sat in the front row, they got the brunt of it. <laughs> no, but the world's worst Gallagher show. Yes, exactly. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, they were in the splash zone. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, but I love, I love going to St. Augustine cause yeah, there's, there's all the kitschy history stuff, but on the other hand, there's real history there. The first recorded marriage in, in America happened in St. Augustine. I didn't know that. It was wow. uh, between a, a woman who was an escaped slave and a Spanish soldier. And you know, it's the, the first, uh, schoolhouse in America, not the one that's on display there, but the first <laughs> it was open there and it was an integrated school for black and white kids. Uh, so it, there's a lot of real history there, and and it's interesting to me to watch how um, I think they I believe they're the only city in Florida with their own archaeologist on the city staff to supervise archaeological digs there, um, and now they're sort of copying it in Pensacola, uh, my hometown, because of course Pensacola and St. Augustine are sort of history rivals. Pensacola actually was founded first, but then a hurricane came along and wiped everybody out. <laughs> Hit the reset button. Yeah, pretty much. And then St. Augustine came along and they're like, ha ha, we've been here all along, <laughs> so we win. Um, but they've done, done excavations in Pensacola of that original settlement and found some pretty amazing stuff. Uh, I should mention, by the way, that the Spanish explorer who landed in Pensacola was named DeLuna. And so the joke is that all of his followers were DeLunatics. <laughs> <laughs> And that sort of kicked off everything in Florida from there. <laughs> um, and in the in the book, you also talk about a little more of like the serious side of St. Yes. Augustine's history, which yes. I, you the know, civil I'm, rights. Yeah, era. yeah, and I'm not from Jacksonville originally, mm -hmm. uh, so I didn't know about this until maybe about a year ago. You just nobody no. mentions it. It's not part of the historical tours. No, no. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, well, St. Augustine uh, was the site of some some uh, protests in the early 60s that ultimately led to the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was arrested in three cities in America, and one of them was St. Augustine. He was leading these protest actions, and um, he tried to get into a whites-only restaurant that was attached to a motel there. And the owner wouldn't let him in. Had stopped him on the on the steps outside and said, "You can't come in. This is only for for uh, whites." And King's like, "You know, no, I'm uh, you know I'm an American citizen. I have a right to come in here and order a meal." And no, 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 you can't come in. This is you're colored. You can't come in. And he ended up calling the cops on King, and King's arrested on the steps and hauled off to jail. So fast forward. This is a Florida story, so there's a twist. Uh, fast forward about 20 years, and uh, the Hilton Corporation comes in and buys the property and says, we're going to tear this down and build a Hilton. Isn't that great? And all the historic preservation people are like, no, you can't tear that down. That's where Martin Luther King was arrested. 
Uh, and so lawsuits began to fly and they all went to uh, mediation and they came up with what I think is a very Florida solution, which is the Hilton people were allowed to tear down the motel and the restaurant, but they kept the steps. <laughs> so steps are where the story the steps, happens. That's right. That's where he got arrested. That's the actual historic point. So like Martin Luther King, you can go stand on the steps, but you can't go into the restaurant because it's not there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you can probably notice by my Ohio State shirt that I'm not from Florida. Two-thirds of the people in Florida um, are not from here, so you're, so, you're in good company. But I, but I have lived here for 16 years mm -hmm. in Jacksonville. But interestingly enough, the school that I went to in Ohio is Miami University. Ah, so the pretenders. When, no, 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 no. No. So it inevitably comes up that it causes immense confusion when I say that because, right. no, I went to Miami University, not yeah. the University you of know, Miami. Miami. Right. We were founded in 1809. So you're, Florida, older, you're older than Miami Florida itself. Florida wasn't a state until 1840. No, 1845. 1845. 1845. Right. And Miami wasn't a city until 1896. 96. Yes. Right. And the University of Miami wasn't founded until 1925. So mm -hmm. Miami, Ohio is, the university is over 100 years older than the University of so Miami. So what's it named for? The Miami Indian tribe in Ohio. Oh, because the, the city of Miami is named for the river. Right. Yeah. But the Miami tribe in Ohio, and the univer Miami University is actually affiliated with the Miami tribe in, mm -hmm. in Oklahoma, like much like the Seminoles are. And, and FSU, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, the University of Miami, despite being less than, well, despite not being founded over a century mm -hmm. after Miami University, they actually sent a letter <laughs> to Miami <laughs> University of Ohio suggesting that we change our name <laughs> in the 30s because it conflicted with theirs. And they, were in, a a, they were in a thing. larger city and they had a, they I'm were sure going to be, I'm sure become a bigger well. university yeah. <laughs> and all this stuff. And no. <laughs> Do they ever play each other in football? Yes. <laughs> and they're actually scheduled to play again soon, I think. Wow. Oh, really? Let me look that up. Google will reveal all. <laughs> and, well, the University of Miami wasn't really famous nationally until their football game team became right. good. Mm -hmm. The U, as it's known. The U. The U. There's a, actually a documentary film about them uh, by a couple of uh, filmmakers named Billy Corbin and Alfred Spellman, who also did this great documentary called Cocaine Cowboys. Oh, I've seen, I've seen yes. Cocaine Cowboys. Yes. Miami University is scheduled to play the University of Miami in football September 2nd in 2023. Where? Oh. At Miami. Which one? <laughs> Which one? <laughs> Not the one in Oxford, Ohio. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> imagine, would, imagine, being a, imagine being a friend that is just brought to that game and you have no <laughs> real investment for? in football. Do you imagine how confusing that is going no, to no, be? No, no, imagine how easy it is. I'm going to root for Miami no matter Miami. what. Yay, Miami. <laughs> Miami just got a touchdown against Miami. <laughs> now, one of them will not score any touchdowns during that game <laughs> unless the, the football team changes. It uh, gets a lot better in the next few years. <laughs> There's still time. When'd you say 2023? Yeah, there's not enough time. <laughs> uh oh, okay. Um, Unless Ben Roethlisberger is going to lose uh, 25 years off of his off of his life and go back to college, I don't think we have a <laughs> chance. Yeah, so, so barring time travel <laughs> mm -hmm. or a true fountain of youth. There you go. And we, we were actually talking about that too, um, like universities having to change mascots and mm -hmm. you know game songs and things like that. Do you have any stories about Florida schools? running into similar issues? Like um, no, I mean, because the, you know, the as you mentioned, the, the one that's sort of potentially offensive, the Seminoles, they, the Florida State has cut this deal with the Seminole tribe where it pays them a lot of money for using it. And so they're like, fine, go, you know, go ahead and use that. Um, um, I did mention, I did make up some mild uh, uh, mockery of, you know, that we've got uh, our football teams are the, the uh, potentially racially insensitive um, Native American uh, tribe name versus the uh, uh, reptiles with brains the size of an olive, uh, and uh, and the and the swirling natural disasters of Miami. So, <laughs> and what about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? Oh well, um, I don't think I mentioned them at all in the book. Uh, there actually is a really good book about their first two seasons. It's called The Yucks, which is what people called the Bucks back then because they were so awful. Uh, it's written by a historian named Jason Vuick, uh, who tells some great stories in there, including one about uh, the time that the coach was asked, Coach, what do you think about the execution of the team? And he said, I'm in favor of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you do mention a little bit about Gasparilla. Yes. 
Can yes. you tell us a little bit about yes, that Yes, the world's story? largest party in, in honor of a pirate who never existed. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it, Gasparilla is named after Jose Gaspar, who was this legendary pirate who didn't actually work as a pirate and and was this story was actually used to promote a, a hotel development <laughs> in the early 1900s but it became an excuse for having this big parade and this big party and socially prominent people get to dress up and and people who are not socially prominent get drunk and throw beads and throw up and, <laughs> and <laughs> urinate in people's bushes and <laughs> you know it's just a, it's a it's a really good excuse for a big party and it's classically florida because it's you know, it's based on something that's fictional. I mean, in the section on on Miami Vice, I tell about how they swooped into these areas in Miami Beach that at the time were really run down and, and almost falling down. And the set decoration people would come in and turn them into these really fancy, glitzy, glamorous nightclubs and hotels. And that the people who li- had a lot of uh, untraceable income at the time in Miami saw it and went, wow, that's a really good idea. And so they started investing in dressing up the real estate out there. And so the Miami Vice people, to me, achieved the Florida dream, which was they told a lie and it came true. <laughs> <laughs> and that's sort of the basis of, of Florida is, you know, we we had our hucksters and uh, and so forth down here in the 1920s telling everybody, it's paradise, come down here, you'll love it. And turns out they were right, you know. <laughs> they were lying, but they were right. <laughs> So can you tell us a little bit about the new book coming out in yes. January? Yes, in January. It's called Cat Tale, The Wild Weird Battle to Save the Florida Panther. I'm already into it. Good, good. <laughs> uh, the um, uh, It's a story I've wanted to tell for 20 years, uh, and I needed an, I needed a good ending, and I finally got one and, and said, okay, now I can write the book. Uh, but it's all about how uh, in 1995, there were fewer than 30 panthers left. They were circling the drain. They really were. And all of the normal methods that scientists use to rescue a, a, a species that's going extinct wouldn't work. They actually tried one of them, and it totally backfired in their faces. And so they were like, oh, my God, what are we going to do now? So they, they did this experiment that had never been tried before of bringing in cougars from Texas, which are sort of a close cousin of the panthers. And they brought in eight female Texas cougars and turned them loose, and they bred with the male panthers and produced healthy panthers. And we had this you know, population boom now where there's now about 200 panthers uh, lurking around out there in the wilderness. Of course, at the same time that they were saving the species, uh, we were failing to protect their habitat. So we now have more panthers than ever before squeezed into a smaller space than ever before. Uh, but it's it's just, a, to me, it's a really fascinating story. And the people involved are really interesting. There's the, there's um, this grizzled old Texas tracker. He's got like, you know, 19th century skills in the 21st century. Um, when uh, when the Endangered Species Act was first passed, some Florida state game officials thought panthers were already extinct and said, when, why would we do anything to protect them? They don't exist. And so the World Wildlife Fund hired this guy who is famous for tracking down and killing mountain lions out there to come find out if there were any panthers left in Florida. And sure enough, he found sign that they were here and he actually found one. And it, he sort of, it's like it flipped a switch and he suddenly became this advocate for these big cats. And he's, he's, you know, that was in the seventies. He's still working with them today. He's in his eighties. Says he's training his grandson to take over for him eventually. (laughs) (laughs) Um, uh, There's a a biologist uh, with the national park service who, uh, you know, they captured the panthers and put radio collars on them to track them. Uh, That was the way they first learned about where they go and what they eat and that kind of thing. And the, the, uh, one of the earliest captures in 1983, something went wrong and the panther got killed. And it's the exact opposite of what they hope to achieve. Exactly. I mean, and and it's sort of like a case where somebody else's curiosity killed the cat. Um, <laughs> and uh, she tried giving this dying panther mouth-to-mouth resuscitation, which honestly is a level of commitment to the job you seldom see in America these days. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, just, uh, you know, there, there are all these really interesting people involved in it. Um, there was a guy who was like Mr. Panther for the longest time, and then he switched sides and became Mr. Development. Um, and so there's just all these really interesting, uh, little angles to it. And of course, as I mentioned, the skunk ape makes an appearance in there as well. Um, so 
it's not quite the wacky fun that that O Florida is, but it's uh, I think it's a really fascinating uh, Florida story, and it's one that I think people in other parts of the country will find interesting as well because what worked with the panther, they're now trying with other species around around the world uh, to try and revive revive them. I'm looking forward to reading that one. Too. It sounds amazing. <laughs> it's available for pre-order now. <laughs> <laughs> hint, hint, <laughs> wink, wink. Hint, hint, hint. I have a kid going to college. <laughs> And you're still reporting for the yes. Times. Oh, yes, They're absolutely. Down yeah. in and St. Pete? In fact, yes. In fact, I went and did an interview today for a, a news story I'm going to do on a guy who is, apparently has the largest personal collection of seashells in the world. <laughs> and uh, most of them were in his house, uh, and now he's donating them to the Florida Museum of Natural History. Tell me, is he single? <laughs> <laughs> no, he is not. <laughs> this is a surprising twist. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he's 79. Aww. And uh, his wife is really into horses and riding, and he told me he didn't understand her passion, but he guessed that was mutual. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair. Yeah. To each his own. <laughs> and there are some pretty quirky things down on the west coast of Florida. Oh, the yeah. um, Scientology community in Clearwater, yes, they've just totally taken over downtown. Taken over Clearwater, yeah. And you walk through downtown, yeah. It's Tom Cruise's. It's awesome. You know, oh, yeah. Penthouse, whatever. Well, I mean, that's <laughs> part of the whole fabric of life in Florida. I mean, you know, we what I mentioned in the book, and we were talking about the population growth here, is think about who has who we have here now. We've got uniform Scientologists, we've got Python Wranglers, we've got uh, monkey breeders, spam kings, uh, strip club moguls, uh, and um, retired CIA guys who fell in love with the place when they were training for the Bay of Pigs. Uh, and we've got 29 electoral college votes. <laughs> There's a presidential election. <laughs> oh, no, no take backsies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's just going to continue to grow as our population grows, you know. And have you seen like a huge shift just with social media kind of exploding and just the way that journalism sort of shifted over the years? What's changed for you since the beginning of your career? Um uh, I do a lot more social media now, and and uh, you know people like to sneer at Twitter, but Twitter is what got me that book contract for O Florida in a way. Um, uh, I we used to do this thing at the Times uh, once a year called the Sour Orange Awards, where we listed you know some of the really wacky, wild stuff that had happened during the previous year, sort of like the Dubious Achievement Awards they used to run in Esquire and the Razzies for Florida. Yeah, exactly, and so. Uh, but then we sort of, you know, that we didn't have room for that anymore. And, but I just kept continually collecting the stories. And when Twitter started, that was a way for me to, that was an outlet. So I would post those stories as a, you know, Oh, Florida, you know, that <laughs> hashtag. And so, um, uh, one of my followers was a woman named Laura Helmuth, who was the science editor at Slate. And she, cause she had gone to college in Florida. And when the George Zimmerman trial came up, the stand your ground case, she contacted me and said, how would you like to blog about Florida for a month while the trial's going on to tell people there's more to Florida than just this controversy? And I said, do you think we can get it all in in a month? Uh, <laughs> and so with the permission of my editors, I did. I wrote blog items about, you know, what it's like to grow up in Florida and about, you know, other stuff like that. And um, when I was done, she said, gee, I really hope you're going to turn this into a book. This was great. And then the uh, an agent in New York contacted me and said, we think it would be great to have a book about Florida come out during the presidential election in 2016, because that's always the one time when the rest of the country gives Florida the side eye. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> and so... Sometimes well-deserved. Exactly. Side exactly. So uh, that, you know, that's why I say Twitter led to a book contract. So... Um, um, so yeah, I have to. I have, I'm posting stuff on Twitter, Facebook. Uh, uh, I've got, I'm, I'm on Pinterest, believe it or not. <laughs> uh, Instagram, although I'm not sure I've quite figured out what Instagram is all about. But um, it, but it, it's great because it's a way for you to communicate with your readers. Number one, but number two, it's it also a way for me to communicate with people whose writing I like. So you know, I have been. I follow a lot of other writers, and we communicate that way, and it's that's been a lot of fun too. Do you even consider Florida to, to be part of the South? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Just it, parts of it. I mean, is the way is the way to put this. <laughs> uh, I mean, I had grits for dinner last night. <laughs> Uh, here, here in Jacksonville. And I mean, you know, growing up, I had a teacher who swore up and down that, that the Civil War wasn't about slavery. It was about states' rights. And our, the woman who went, I don't want to become our class valedictorian was like, yeah, states' rights to own slaves, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and you know, there's certainly plenty of 
Confederate flags around that you, you can see all over the place, including in Hillsborough County. There's a guy who flies one that I swear is as big as, you know, uh, as big as the flag over the, over the, uh, uh, over anything in Washington. Um, and we've definitely had lots of racial problems. In fact, I tell in, in the book, I tell the story about a big fight in the seventies in Pensacola over a Scambia high school where the mascots were the rebels and they flew the Confederate flag and their fight song was Dixie. And there ended up being a big riot there at the school and uh, involving both white students and black students. And, um, uh, and because it's Florida, of course, there was a twist. This local politician got involved, a guy named Smokey Peden, who was a, an ex gospel singer, ex deputy state representative. And Smokey, you know, as a result of all this uh, racial tension and racial fighting, Smokey said, "You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna run for sheriff now. I'm gonna be a I'm gonna be your sheriff. I'm gonna run on a law and order basis." And the only problem that Smokey ran into is that he was arrested uh, because he was financing his campaign through selling cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he's a drug runner. At least he wasn't a racist. So he had, I mean, I thought he should have turned it into an advantage, you know, to say, look, I know the law from both sides. <laughs> you know? His name was Smokey. He should have been arrested for selling crack cocaine because you can <laughs> well, smoke that. This is this was before the crack cocaine. This is before that. This was the 80s. This is still the cocaine cowboy era. Did they get the bandit, though? <laughs> That's my main concern. Got Smokey. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. He was East Bannon down. <laughs> Have you done the Florida man meme, the birthday meme? We were I, talking. <laughs> I did and actually got a, got a story that was very tragic. Was it? Yes. Some of it, sometimes it's sad. And, and, uh, and so, you know, I, I, when this was going around, I was warning people saying, you know, not every Florida man story is a funny story. Some of them are really, really sad and will, you know, you're, it's like, yikes. Or they look funny on the surface, and then you dig into it, and you're like, "This well, is and see a lot of them, There are a lot of them like that because, as I mentioned in the book, um, uh, in Florida, tragedy often wears the mask of comedy. I mean, the, the example I give is a guy who he was out hog hunting, and he accidentally shot his girlfriend in the leg, and so the joke was, "Oh, he mistook her for a hog," and so and there was a radio DJ who was. Uh, you know, playing playing hog calls on the air and, mm-hmm. and trying to compare pictures of a hog. Oh, it was just, it was nasty. And uh, the real story was, A, very tragic because she wound up with a sort of a permanent leg injury, but also very inspiring because it actually brought the couple closer. He stuck with her. They wound up getting married. He's taken her to all of her rehab and everything. And it, they're actually more in love now than they were before he shot her. Uh, which, uh, <laughs> you know, maybe only in Florida you could say that a sentence like that. But I mean, it's, it's, there was a lot more to the story than just that initial headline. Um, uh, so you always have to just bear that in mind when you're dealing with it. That's why I, I try to make the point of it's Florida that's weird. And yeah, the Florida people. But, you know, bear in mind that some of the, some of the, uh, some of the stories that happen here happen here because uh, we are generally ranked 49th among the states in funding for mental health treatment. To which, as a Floridian, I can only say thank God for Texas. <laughs> I take it there are 50? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you think that's a problem that people, you know, we make for a really great headline. Yeah. You got to admit that. You know that. You've written some of those yes. headlines. But is yeah. the problem that people don't dig any deeper than that headline? Yeah, absolutely. Because a lot of people skim these days. I mean, that's sort of the nature of social media is everybody skims. They they look at the headline. They don't click on the link. They don't read all the cautionary stuff. Um, you know, they don't read, oh, they'll read, ha ha, this Florida man was naked and eating spaghetti with his hands and they won't read, oh, and he was Baker acted and uh, has a serious substance abuse problem. He's been sent to rehab several times. You know, it's real life has a lot of really uh, complicated and sometimes nasty aspects to it. And we want to be diverted and we want to be entertained. We don't necessarily want to engage with what the real issues are. And if you, if you click the links, sometimes you'll wind up dealing with that stuff you don't want to think about. But it's there. And on that dark note, thank you for joining us <laughs> for Completely Booked. Can we go back to podcast. talking to mermaids again? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, tell us something genuinely funny. <laughs> well, and that's, I, I can mean. tell you about the burglar who uh, uh, encountered uh, urns full of human and pet ashes in Silver Shores and uh, tried to sniff them, <laughs> tried to snort them because he thought they were drugs. <laughs> I think I think bath salts really put us on the map. Like that kind of got the global. It did, except zombie, it wasn't bath salts. Zombie thing. It wasn't bath salts. It, it, people said it was bath salts, and then when they got the toxicology results, this is the this is the the um, uh, the face eater guy, right? Yeah, yes. yeah, the guy yeah. who was who was eating someone's eating a homeless guy's face on the. It was one Rick naked and, homeless man eating the face of another naked homeless it, man on the Rickenbacker Causeway within full view of the Miami Herald newsroom. 
and uh, a cop showed up and shot the attacker and um and you know and the mayor said we think it was bath salts and bath salts were everywhere and then they get the toxicology results back he was high on marijuana that's it that's it see and i live here in florida i still thought it was bath salts <laughs> yeah so sometimes like, sometimes that initial headline that. sticks and you don't dig any bath. deeper i didn't, no, didn't know that bath salts. no 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 but i mean it's there you know again to me weirdness is everywhere it's not just on the police log i mean there's a museum in Florida that has the largest collection of fossilized poop uh, in the world. The South Florida Museum. <laughs> and we interviewed them on Completely Booked. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this was before us. Well, I so I lived like in Bradenton. I, yeah. I volunteered there. Did you go there. see Snooty? Yes. I, I worked his 64th birthday party. Oh, yeah. yeah. Snooty, the most famous captive manatee, uh-huh. tragically He's- killed. And so now there's a proposal to uh, to replace the Confederate statue with a statue of Snooty, which I think is a great idea. Because he Everybody died recently, a, like he was 69. I he was think, 69, when he, when he and, died. The, and yeah, and then the day the next day is when he got trapped in a, a a vent that wasn't supposed to be open, and he and he drowned. Oh, I didn't know. See, I need to read the stories that oh, are attached to the headlines. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I saw he died. I didn't know it was yeah, that. Way. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, gosh. it was fairly tragic, and the the museum director lost her job as a result, and it was it was. Wow. It was horribly tragic. And but people it was incredible to see this outpouring of intergenerational love for Snooty. I mean, grandparents who had gone to see Snooty when they were kids and then wound up taking their children and their grandchildren were showing up saying, Oh my God, how are we gonna go on without Snooty? It's a thing. We had the t shirts. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Manatee County. It was like that was the Yeah. I he was, the face, of he was the face County? of Manatee he was. County. He was the Manatee of Manatee <laughs> County. And so I actually wrote an obituary for Snooty. <laughs> For the paper, because my editor said we want you to do a, a legitimate, straight-ahead obit for this cute and cuddly animal that people <laughs> love, um, and uh, it was it was he led a pretty amazing life for a captive manatee. He learned tricks when he was a, a calf that he was still doing forty years later. Uh, and one scientist pointed to those his ability to do tricks, and his mother had learned the same tricks and pointed to those as proof that manatees were not as stupid as people thought. They're actually as smart as dolphins. Um, so, yeah, but yes. And so they, so now they've sort of traded Snooty in for poop. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's Florida. That, yeah, I mean. <laughs> Classic Florida. Yeah. I, I want to make as cute of a T-shirt, I don't think. The I don't Snooty think shirts so. were, pretty, well, were pretty great. You know, poop happens, <laughs> what can I tell you? <laughs> Is there anything else that you'd like our listeners to know? Being Floridians, what, especially environmentally speaking? Uh, stop watering your lo- lawn so much. <laughs> <laughs> I guess is the big thing. Uh, you know, that's the number one use of water, and we're running out of it. And it seems kind of silly to, to to be pumping water out of the ground just to put it back on the on the ground again. Um, um, so it, that's supposed to be the next sort of battleground, environmental battleground is water. I mean, we've had a lot of water quality problems in mm-hmm. Florida lately, in case you hadn't noticed. Uh, toxic algae blooms, um, uh, too much fertilizer in the water, too much poop in the water. There's a whole series of, of beaches in the panhandle that are closed this weekend because there's too much fecal bacteria in the water right now. It's like, well, folks, we know where that came from. Why, do you, why can't we stop that? <laughs> Um, uh, and this sort of tendency among the people in charge to kick the can down the road because they know in four years they're going to be facing a bunch of voters who don't know anything about it because they just got here. So um, I guess that's sort of the, the bottom line is that uh, if we want people to continue coming to Florida to visit, um, you know, other than new attractions at Disney World, the only way to keep them coming back is if we keep our environment clean. Uh, you know, if you can't swim in the water, what's the point of going to the beach? Mm-hmm. We, we at least need the promise of paradise. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, and part of, and it, it amazes, I, I am repeatedly amazed at how, number one, people start are starting to get the fact that the environment is the economy in Florida. And if you screw one up, you're going to screw the other one up. We saw that most clearly with the uh, BP oil spill in 2010, where, um, you know, we had oil on the beaches eight in eight panhandle counties and the tourism took a nosedive, not just there, but all over the state because people in other countries are like, oh, there's oil on the beaches in Florida. We can't come, even if it was, you know, an Atlantic Coast beach that's on no, no oil whatsoever. Um, so no, that's number one. But number two, how loyal people are to, uh, to environmental features of our state. Uh, there was a proposal under Governor Rick Scott to allow um, some s- big changes to the state park system, to allow uh, a lot more very intrusive uses uh, to some of them, in some cases hunting cattle grazing, timber harvesting. 
And they wanted to open up uh, the most popular state park in Florida is Honeymoon Island in Dunedin. And it's, a, it's an island and it's fairly pristine and there's no overnight camping, no RVs or anything allowed in there. That's what keeps it pristine. Right. And, and that's why people love it. Well, they wanted to open that up to RVs and overnight camping. And a, a thousand people showed up at the public hearing for that. And I'd say 999 of them were opposed to it. <laughs> wow. And there was talk about standing out on the causeway and linking arms to stop the RVs from coming in. And, uh, and you would not believe how fast all the politicians and bureaucrats backpedaled away from that and said, okay, we're not going to make those changes. And some people, but I mean, in elected officials, uh, it didn't matter what party they were in, they were all uniformly opposed to this because they, they said, we like it the way it is. It's gorgeous. It's a great feature of our community. It's one of the reasons we're happy to live here. Don't change it. And they didn't. So it, it, it's always, it's actually kind of inspiring to see that when it happens. But the only, the downside is it usually takes a crisis to bring people out like that. And then you kind of wish, you know, you'd see it more just day to day. Proactively. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Craig, for My joining pleasure. us. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning into Completely Booked this week. We hope you enjoyed hearing Craig's tales of this wonderfully wonky place we call home. We have plenty of copies of Oh, Florida in the library's catalog for you to check out. And be sure to keep an eye out for Craig's newest book coming out early next year. If you like today's podcast, please be sure to rate and review us. And you can also follow us on social media at Jack's Library for updates on all library happenings. And a special thanks to Kristen again for coming in on her day off and making a guest appearance on this episode. Until next time, I'm Gabby. Gabby.